America. Only in America. Only in America. Only in America. Only in America. A pretty amazing show this week. I'm talking with actress and author Diane Guerrero, who tells me about when she was 14 years old and her immigrant parents were deported from the United States. I had to pack two suitcases. So how do you fit your parents' life into one suitcase and say, okay, well, this is this should be everything that you need? It was heartbreaking, and it, and it really messed with my head. And she talks about the psychological and emotional impact of family separations writ large, but also her own struggles. We separate families and we deport people, but we never talk about the psychological and emotional damage that occurs and the lifelong issues that ensue. Oh, say, can you see? And later, we hear from the tiny but mighty seven year old Indonesian American singer who offered Major League Soccer fans an amazing rendition of the national anthem. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani with Only in America. My guest today is Diane Guerrero, an actress, author, and immigration advocate. You may know her from her role as Maritza Ramos on Orange is the New Black, or as Lena on Jane the Virgin. Diane is out with a young adult book entitled My Family Divided, One Girl's Journey of Home, Loss, and Hope. It's based on her previous memoir, in the country we love, my family divided. Writing for a younger audience growing up fast in a changing world, Dan recounts her youth and the deportation of her parents back to Colombia when she was just 14 years old. Diane and I talked about the nation's family separation policy, the pain of packing a suitcase for her mother on the day of that deportation, and, well, because I absolutely had to know, her favorite immigration movie. You know what? I remember watching when I was a kid, I went to the movie theater with my parents and, you know, there weren't many immigration movies out that I had seen. And I certainly hadn't seen this story as a kid, um, but it was Mi Familia. Do you remember mm-hmm. that movie? I've never seen that one. No. Oh, my goodness. Essentially, it was about a, a Mexican family who crossed the border and who did everything that they could to bring their family to safety. And then, of course, and all those kids that they brought over, they grew up in East L.A. And then, you know, trouble ensues. <laughs> right. That's a much more, uh, much more serious and meaningful uh, answer than I would have given, which is, you know, coming to America with Eddie Murphy. Oh, that's oh, that's a great one. That's actually that. Yeah, that's my favorite, actually. Um, Sam, can I can I go back and say coming to America? Uh, you know, you you totally make my day. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever you like, whatever you like. Yeah, uh, one of my favorites for sure. All right, so you've just written this really, really, really incredible book, My Family Divided, and it has so much in it that I, I want to talk to you about. But I guess my first question is, why did yourself and, and Erica Moroz write this for the young adult audience? What, what was your thinking there? Well, I mean, it's an adaptation to In the Country We Love. And when my first book came out, In the Country We Love, I went to a lot of different schools. I went to high schools. I went, and then, and then of course, I did a huge university tour. Um, So I was basically going all over the country with the book uh, to different universities. And I met a lot of young people there, not only young people, but also teachers from the community who would come up to me and say, thank you so much for this story. I've been using this book to teach this subject, immigration. And then I started thinking, my goodness, well, this happened to me when I was 14. And I really wish that I had some literature, I mean, going all the way back to, you know, from kindergarten, you know, I wish I had some literature so that I could relate to what was happening in my family and what was happening in my community. Because when my family and I were separated, I really felt alone. And I I couldn't really relate to anyone or any or anything. And so we, we thought it would be a great idea. And especially all, be, because of all the, the teachers that would come up to me, I said, this is exactly what I need to do. Because these are the messages, this deportation and family separation, obviously, it affects the family and is severely damaging for a family. But we have no idea the damage that it's doing to children. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're seeing now what's happening at the border on our our borders uh, with family separation and these kids being put into cages, that kids need to understand our immigration system more than ever now. 
I completely agree. And, and one of the elements that jumped out at me you know, fairly early on in the book was when you started talking about um, the mental health issues that you know, your brother was confronting. And I just think that that is, it's glossed over, if not completely ignored in, you know, the impact of the, the broken immigration system. That is why I wanted to talk about this issue is because we separate families and we deport people, but we never talk about the psychological and emotional damage that occurs and the lifelong issues that ensue. And that's why I was very candid about my own mental health issues as well as my family's because I wanted to paint a picture of what's really going on. You know, we tend to forget about these families and not see them as human beings, but we are real human beings and we have feelings and there are chemical imbalances that occur in our brains when when we suffer such trauma like family separation. And these are the things that we need to talk about when, when discussing immigration and when discussing deportations. These things need to be added to the conversation. One of the really kind of key figures later in the book and uh, in your life is, is Lorraine. Could you tell me a little about the story of Lorraine and you know, what, that, what that meant to you? I mean, you know, growing up in the, in, in the Latino community that I did, mental health wasn't something that we talked about. It was certainly something that was viewed for crazy people or something that people thought of as a luxury that people in immigrant communities were not afforded. You know, I remember growing up and telling my mother, mom, I'm, I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I'm sad. I don't, I don't feel good. I'm, I'm scared. I don't, I don't, I can't sleep well, or, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy, <laughs> you know, which is such a, you know, for a lot of people, it's such a privilege to, um, to, to pursue happiness, right? Then that's all about, and that's, of course, the American dream and the American motto is the uh, pursuit of happiness, or part of the, the American model, uh, motto is the pursuit of happiness. But my mother turned around and God bless her. And obviously her ideas around mental health are severely different after undergoing family separation and everything that's happened in our lives. But she told me that I needed to be grateful and that basically I wasn't sad and I had nothing to be sad about because I was uh, in this country and I was a U.S. citizen and I had no reason to be upset. And she was like, and your father and, and I love you and you eat and you have a roof over your head and you should be happy. Um, meanwhile, she's depressed as hell. And I don't know, I don't understand why she could be, yet she's not naming it, right? So that, that idea of mental health from an early age, I just, it, it was, it was just non-existent for me. And so when when I was growing up and experiencing all this trouble while having mental health issues, while having uh, learning disabilities all by myself, not knowing how to medicate, not knowing how to help all of these feelings and, and this anger, I got to the point where I needed to seek special help, when I needed to seek professional help. And the minute I walked in there, Lorraine told me that it was okay to feel the way I was feeling. And that's something that our communities often don't have. They don't have that permission to feel the way that they're feeling uh, because either we deserve it, either that's our, those are our cards and that we've been dealt and we just have to deal with it. Or, you know, it's something that you hide because it's, it's just something that you don't talk about. So that was the first time that I was allowed to talk about my life and say, I think these things are happening because all, I think all the trouble that I'm experiencing now is happening as a result of the trauma that I experienced as a young kid. And that was life changing. And, and you write, for me. I mean, so, so movingly about those traumas. I mean, the, the idea of having to you know, pack your parents' suitcase for their, for their deportation as you're writing it, whether it's in the first book or in this adaptation for a younger audience, how did that feel? Oh my God. It was horrible. Yeah, it, it was, it was horrible. I didn't know, I didn't know how to pack a bag for myself, let alone my parents who were going away forever. And I had to pack two suitcases. So how do you fit your parents' life into one suitcase and say, okay, well, this is, this should be everything that you need. It was heartbreaking and it, and it really messed with my head because I didn't, 
I really found myself not knowing what to do. And as a kid, when you feel helpless and your parents aren't around or no one's around sort of telling you what to do, you're going to internalize that and figure out a way that this whole thing can be your fault <laughs> and figure out a way that you can look at inside yourself and say, you're, inadequ you're inadequate and you deserve what's happening to you. And so, yeah, those moments were awful. And let alone, you know, well, there, there, was, there was that, of course. And then there was the fact that I packed my mom's suitcase with mismatching shoes and winter coats. And, a, and the winter coat. I love that. And a winter coat where she would never need that where she was going. And, of course, I get a call from my mother saying, honey, why did you pack me a winter coat? Did you know where I was going? And my answer was, no, <laughs> I don't know. I've never been there. I don't know this country. All I know is this. And, you know, I, I think I remember being rude and it was like, well, you should have packed it yourself then. <laughs> And what was it, what was it like writing all that down? Because I mean, you, you obviously live it, you experience it, you, you you have that emotion of the moment. But then looking back on it, you know, years years later, and trying to describe it to somebody else. Yeah, you know, I really didn't realize how hard it was going to be. You know, I feel like I consider my now I'm 32, but at the I guess at the time where I wrote it, it was like my late 20s, and even then, like I didn't realize how immature I was. I thought I was fine. And I thought I had, you know, because I had talked about the story in the media and because I had written some articles about it, and because I was open to my peers and everyone around me about what happened to me, I thought that I had, that I was totally fine. But it was difficult. It was really difficult. There were times I didn't want to do it. I was angry. A lot of emotions came up of things that I hadn't remembered in a very long time. And I said, how could that happen to me? I remember everything. And it's like, no, you're a human being and you also put things away in your in your mind so that you can cope. So that was, you know, firsthand what I uh, experiencing the damage that was that had occurred and the trauma that I actually did have um, what became very apparent to me when I was writing the book. And it was very apparent that I was clearly not over it, that I still had many unresolved issues and that this is a lifelong process, you know, I'm going to be dealing with these issues for the rest of my life. And I need to build, I need to create tools that are going to help me turning everything that I have, that I had created sort of upside down and just create a, a, just a new life for myself. One that includes self-love, one that includes acceptance and, and forgiveness, and so those are the things that I'm currently working on. Um, but when you but yeah, that out, was, let me know. yeah. Oh well, believe me, I'll I'll let everybody know if I find the secret. But yeah, it was it it was difficult, but it was also fun too. Like you know, I was also discovering you know things that I did love about my family and about myself along the way. It's kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what do you think your life would be if it wasn't for the Boston Arts Academy? Oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> You know, art, arts and education is so important to me because I saw firsthand how helpful, how, and just, and, and how necessary it is to one's life. Because I grew up at a time where uh, arts and education were heavily funded, I guess in Boston where, where I grew up, uh, I was able to really express myself creatively and sort of escape in ways that I really wasn't being afforded, you know, through my parents and through my life at home that really gave me the opportunity to be imaginative. And so when you have an imagination, you know, I know it sounds cliche, but anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine yourself living a different life or completing certain goals or tasks that you thought were not possible, then there is, there is a light, right? There's at least a reference and there is a possibility that you can get there. Whereas I know a lot of some of my peers that I grew up with didn't have that. And it made it very difficult later on to see themselves in a different life other than what they had been given and what they had grown up around, which was poverty, you know, not taking no for an answer uh, and, and giving up. And so the Boston Arts Academy for me was someone or, or something saying yes to me 
And that meant the world because it was a place that I could escape and a place that I could be myself and a place that I felt that, you know, like anything was possible. So what goes through your mind as, you know, you are reading about um, the stories of the, the children and the families on the border? I know you've spoken at some of the rallies here in D.C., but also across the country. What goes through your mind as, as you see that happening? It's injustice, uh, inhumanity. I hate to say this, but I guess not shocking. It's not shocking for me, one, because I lived it, but two, because of what I see going on in our country right now and the intense uh, and direct attacks to the immigrant community. So I was not shocked. I was hurt that, you know, I I feel like when I tell my story, people can't believe it. (laughs) Um, People say, why? Well, who did you stay with? And how was that possible? And no government agency checked on you? No, this is happening and it's happening much worse. And so when I was seeing this going on and also I was seeing what was going on along with every American in this country and along with every person in this country, I, I saw two things. I saw people get motivated and and appalled and 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 start looking at the immig- you know the quote unquote immigration issue a little closer and then i saw people who just were not affected by it and comments like well that's what you get if you cross the border that's what happens you know if you cross here illegally and so both of those things i think were impactful for me and it just motivated me a lot more and seeing The positive of all of this is seeing people who never have talked about this issue, who never considered influencing anyone on this issue, come out. And that is a very special thing. And I think that we cannot unhear the cries of of those children. We can't unsee those pictures of of these boys in cages. And, And so I think this is a time for us to really rise up and unite so that we can change these evil practices. Your book, My Family Divided, is about your experience being separated from your your mother and father. What do you think the book is that these children write in 20 years? I can't, I don't know. And and I, I say that because I'm I'm one in a million. And I hate to I, I hate to say that, but I am very lucky. A lot of these kids are not and will not be. This trauma and this damage is so deep, that it's going to take a lot for you to get out of it. And that's, that's the message that I'm sending. That's what I'm talking. That's why I'm here speaking about this, because I'm telling you as a person who got out, there were so many, and when I say get out is I got out of my head, got out of my hurt, got out of my pain, got out of the rejection to be where I am today. And there's not many like me that have had my similar experience that are here today. There are some, but not a lot. Being here right now, it was so hard. It was so hard for me. I can't even imagine some of these kids that are experiencing this at such an early age. What gives you hope? Movements, people who care, young kids who are stepping up and deciding that that these issues matter and that they need to get involved now. Community participation. That gives me hope. Mm -hmm. So my last, my last uh, question or request, if you will, the name of the podcast is only in America. So if you could finish this sentence only in America, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Only in America can a girl with deported parents make something really special of herself. And then 14 years later, see kids in cages at the border. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. Like I said, I I really, really, really enjoyed the book. And this has been an awesome conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate this too. Thank you so much. Diane Guerrero is an actress, author, and immigration advocate. There's more about Diane's life and work at our website, immigrationforum.org. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie, 
to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. This is Only in America, and I'm Ali Nirani. Diane Guerrero was just 14 when she went through that trauma of seeing her parents deported. In his recent essay in the Wall Street Journal, conservative columnist Rehan Salam wrote, we need to recognize that the immigration debate isn't really about immigrants. In truth, it's about the children of immigrants. Indeed, it's the millions of U.S. citizen children of legal immigrants who will bear the brunt of the Trump administration's new plan to deny green cards to those who use public benefits like food and housing vouchers. In Houston, immigrant groups predict this will affect more than 70 percent of the 35,000 immigrants who apply for green cards in the city each year. Here's Randy Capps of the Migration Policy Institute speaking on Houston Matters on Houston Public Media. Well, if you have immigrants that stop withdrawing from public benefits, one area where that's likely to affect people more generally is in the healthcare area. If people are more likely to be uninsured, they wait longer to get health care, more of them show up at hospital emergency rooms. You know, those are county hospitals, Harris County and throughout the state of Texas. That could have an impact on the quality of service, the ability to provide service at public hospitals, and also on county taxpayers. And David Beer at the Cato Institute goes further, saying the plan, quote, uses the welfare state as an excuse to wall off the country. Also from Houston, the city's police chief, Art Acevedo, a friend of the forum and member of the Law Enforcement Immigration Task Force, told NBC that courthouses should be sanctuaries for victims and witnesses. He said that if you lose witnesses, crime goes up. Chief Acevedo was reacting to an NBC News investigation which found that ICE, or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, have been arresting suspected undocumented immigrants in courthouses in increasing numbers. This is stopping many victims of crimes and witnesses from coming forward for fear of deportation. Here's Denver City Attorney Kristen Bronson. Enforcement actions in our courthouses is a bad idea, it's a bad policy, and it's having a terrible impact. We have 30 reliable reports of domestic violence victims backing out of their cases because they're afraid they're going to get deported. When you dismiss the charges, practically speaking, what does that mean? It means that abusers are going without consequences. It means that abusers are beginning to feel that they are immune from prosecution. Finally, if an interview with Diane Guerrero isn't awesome enough, let's go to Los Angeles, where seven-year-old Malia Emma Chandra Wijaj brought the house down when she sang the national anthem before the Major League Soccer game between the LA Galaxy and the Seattle Sounders. Malia's parents, Esther and Arman, Indonesian immigrants, make sure the children don't forget their roots. Arman told the Jakarta Post, we always speak Indonesian to the children and encourage them to speak Indonesian back to us. In addition to the national anthem, Arman and Esther also introduced traditional Indonesian songs to Malia and her brother Mark. According to Arman, most of the nights when the kids are going to bed, we put on gamelan music as their lullaby. So, it seems fitting to close out this week's pretty awesome episode, listening to Malia sing our nation's national anthem. That's all for this week. Let us know what you think of the show. Send an email to onlyinamerica at immigrationforum.org. Our show is produced by Regina Medina and Emily Chow. The executive producer is Kathleen Farrell. Thanks for listening. Join us again next week.